Okay, frack it. We're doing this. Blue versus green bubbles, SMS versus RCS, Google versus Apple, exclusive versus cross-platform, rage versus the machine, whatever. From iMessage for Android or the web to universal profile to Messages Plus, where anybody can have bougie gold bubbles for just three bucks a month. I'm kidding, kinda. Hit that subscribe button and bell to show your support for in-depth tech coverage, and then let's go. Apple has a messages problem, which means we, iPhone owners, have a messages problem. And this is actually nothing new. It started way back with the original iPhone in 2007. Now what I wanna do is show you SMS texting. So I just go to that SMS icon in the upper left-hand corner. Why green? Because green was the color for revolutionary phone, Steve Jobs decided, which back then meant carrier-dependent features, like making calls and sending texts, as opposed to blue, which was for a breakthrough internet communicator, like browsing the web or checking email. SMS was all the app did, that was it. Send little green bubbles containing little text messages until iPhone OS 3 in 2009. The big news here is MMS. After shipping the App Store, they had time to go back and add photos, audio and video files, and location, at which point Apple just victory lapped by renaming the whole entire SMS app to Messages. The bubbles were all still green because they were all still carrier-dependent services. AT&T will be ready to support MMS later this summer. Back then, everyone was green. Everyone was these green bubble friends. Even though at that point, it just didn't even matter. Steve Jobs was fed up. Yuck. Because SMS and MMS just sucked. They absolutely sucked. SMS was so limited that Apple had to stitch together multiple fragments in the app interface just to render longer messages. And MMS degraded image and video quality just way more than like the 420th re-upload of a crap post meme to Reddit. And it lacked features, the exact same kind of features that BlackBerry and their BBM service were just ruling the mobile world with at the time. Because yes, network effects are nothing new. If you wanted to deal or date in big business markets, or get cheap messaging only plans in emerging markets, you had to be on BBM or you just weren't anywhere. And carriers totally didn't care. SMS and MMS, they were one of the most profitable legal businesses ever devised by human beings, especially SMS, which cost almost nothing for the carrier to transit, but for which they charged exorbitant fees to the customer, like take out a second mortgage if you were ever texting overseas. So when Steve Jobs sent his head of iPhone software, Scott Forstall, to talk to the carriers about modernizing SMS and MMS, about adding key features and reducing costs, they weren't having it. You mean more work for less money? Ichuta, basically. And Apple had a problem. They were getting ready to announce their next bigger thing, the original iPad in 2010. There'd be a cellular version available, but it would be data only, not full on phone service, which meant no phone app and no messages app. Now, Apple was gonna address phone with FaceTime, first on the iPhone 4 in June, and then later on the iPad 2 in March of 2011. But for SMS and MMS, I'm calling you on the new iMac, and how do I look? Oh, you look awesome, that's sweet. <laughs> Apple already had iChat for instant messaging on the Mac. They'd had it since like 2002. And by 2011, it was rolling six versions deep. It supported text, voice and video, status, visual backdrops, screen sharing, and a variety of local, popular, and standard protocols from Bonjour to AOL to Google to Yahoo that were already fading in popularity, including encrypted communications over Apple's own .Mac service. But it also had just a ton of technical debt. So rather than bring iChat to the iPhone and iPad, Apple decided to build something new. We're launching a new messaging service between all iOS 5 customers, and we call it iMessage. Based on their newly implemented APNS, or Apple Push Notification Service, fully end-to-end -end encrypted, delivery notifications, read receipts, typing indicators, supported over carrier networks and Wi-Fi, which meant on the iPhone, it could be fully integrated right into the existing Messages app, text put zero, literally no barrier of entry. And you could register iMessage with a phone number if you had an iPhone, but also with an email address on either the iPhone or the iPad. And if you sent to a registered email, it would just go through as an iMessage. But if you sent it to a phone number, it would check to see if that number was registered. And then if it was, it would also just go through as an iMessage. But if it wasn't, it would fall back to SMS or MMS. Just super easy, but also maybe way more of an inconvenience. Yeah, really. Because you needed, we needed to know which messages weren't secure and could possibly cost us text messaging fees 
especially exorbitant international text messaging fees, and which were end-to-end -end encrypted, free as in data, and offered those additional features like delivery and read receipts. So Apple decided to make them distinct. They kept SMS and MMS locked on OG carrier service green and made iMessage just internet communicator blue. And that was a problem because in that time, the whole entire messaging market wasn't just changing, it was exploding. WhatsApp is ex the most engaging app that, that we've ever seen exist on mobile. BlackBerry just simply refused to take BBM cross-platform, so WhatsApp cloned all their stickiest features and went big phone love in their place. BlackBerry panicked, tried adding even more features to BBM, more than a Craig Federighi iTunes gag. I think we've nailed it. And as handset sales plummeted, and lock-in became lock-out, BlackBerry even tried going cross-platform with BBM themselves, but there was just way too much technical debt and it was just way too late. WhatsApp was singled out as a threat to Messenger by Facebook spyware, got scooped up for a cool $20 billion, or 20 Instagrams, and BBM, and eventually BlackBerry, RIP. Google, who made Gmail and YouTube ubiquitous, threw a ton of half-baked messaging products at the internet wall, just hoping something anything would stick. There was chat and talk and voice and wave and buzz and plus, minus maybe, who knows, hangouts, messages, meet, and more. But the quirks of their product manager fiefdom cultures and the savagery, the utter savagery of their internal politics just cast them all down and smote their ruin across the Mountain View side, leaving Google stupefyingly with nothing and Facebook terrifyingly with everything. But messaging isn't really a zero sum game, it's multiplayer. Yes, it's fractured, it's regionalized, it's demographic. Tencent's WeChat, Line in Japan and Taiwan, Signal for the InfoSec community, Telegram for people who get really upset when Facebook is down, and just a host of apps with DMs that you can slide into from Discord to Slack, Twitter to, yes, Facebook's Instagram. When it comes to iMessage though, it is legit tough to know where that slots in because Apple doesn't release any directly comparable usage numbers or metrics to the public. They have almost 2 billion active devices on the market, and everything except the Apple TV has iMessage, including over a billion iPhones. They're in a billion pockets, y'all, a billion pockets. Measuring the dark matter, carrying the one, dividing by zero, and Apple's global market share, it's pretty clear iMessage isn't threatening Facebook or Tencent anytime soon. Not anywhere and not with anyone, except, except for US teenagers, where, it's just dominating. Like over 70% of kids really, really like iPhones and really, really, really like iMessage. And you might think those two things are related, but it's just never that simple because the iPhone has well over 60% of the Japanese market, but Line is what's dominant there. So why in the US? Because different regions had different cost structures over time and different network effects took hold around different messaging services. Carriers in other countries had higher texting rates for longer, pushing people towards whatever messaging app was getting the most traction. And US carriers pushed people towards unlimited texting plans way earlier, so people stayed in the SMS apps way longer, and iMessage is built right into the SMS app on the iPhone. So there was just way less incentive to move to any other messaging app. Why teens and not everybody? Because Facebook effectively became the internet for a lot of older Americans, and Messenger came right along with it. What if BlackBerry had made BBM cross-platform sooner? or Apple had gone all out on iMessage features earlier? Utu only knows. But it took until 2016 to push out stickers and apps to bubble and screen effects to tap back reactions and more. Like payment with Square Cash. Things other services had had for several years already. And Apple still has problems. iPhone users still have problems. Because messages still falls back onto insecure, feature poor SMS and MMS. Not just for Android, but for anyone still using an old flip phone because burner or digital dopamine detox or because they're just never getting one of those highfalutin tricorder things. Even for other iPhone users who happen to be off data for any reason, unless you disable the option in settings, your iMessage can fail over to SMS for them as well. And not to just go and get all Max Weinback about it, but that's bad for iPhone users because we're the ones whose comms are effectively being transited as plain text at that point. And we're the ones being barraged 
by an endless stream of green bubble non-messages telling us in excruciating detail how someone laughed or loved or like reacted to our replies. And that makes it bad for Android and other phone users too, because it becomes so damn annoying for iPhone users that we sometimes stop including them in our group messages and they miss out on being part of the group. And yes, if you don't have Disney+, Plus, you'll miss out on Baby Yoda. And I lost out on my old Pokemon Go raid group because I left Facebook and Messenger and they wouldn't come join me on Discord. But the barrier to me rejoining Messenger is just my soul. And Disney Plus is like half a Netflix at this point. But the barrier to getting iMessage is a $350 to $1,000 phone and maybe an experience that they don't like in any other way. Now, mm -hmm. Apple could address this by making iMessage for Android, which they totally won't because while Eddie Q suggested it way back in 2013, so Apple could make a play for the global messaging market, Craig Federighi didn't see a way for Apple to win over WhatsApp users, only lose iPhone customers. And while services are a volume play, Apple's really never been about the most, they've been about the premium. And still, to this day, iMessage as an exclusive is just a huge advantage for Apple's biggest market and one of their key demographics, maybe huger than Sony's God of War for the PlayStation or Google's camera app for the Pixel or whatever. But what if they did? What if Apple did make iMessage for Android? Well, then some more people could get in on the iMessage action with end-to-end -end encryption, annihilating some of the SMS failover and reaction readouts, but only some because iMessage wouldn't be integrated into the out-of-the-box SMS app on Android. So you'd have to download it set it up for SMS, register your number for iMessage and make it your default if it would even provide all of those options and you wanted a similar experience. And opposite to how it is on the iPhone, that is just one of the biggest barriers of entry imaginable. And sure, there's already signal for cross-platform secure comms, but the network effect of iMessage among US teens and US tech media types means not having to convince anyone else in your life to download and switch to it with you. At least if you choose not to care about Apple, just totally Sherlocking another app category and removing cross-platform as a major differentiator and don't think regulators would care either. Will you commit to ending Finsta? Which is something that we seem to just intellectually flip-flop about all the time. Also, if you're not worried that Apple's history with services and cross-platform apps means iMessage for Android probably wouldn't be as bad as iTunes for Windows but maybe only as good as Apple Music for Android or TV Plus for Tizen. You know, if either of those suddenly had to scale to support potentially another billion users or so, it's no big deal. And Apple Music and TV Plus do do it, but those aren't services Apple subsidizes through the profit margins of hardware that they help sell, like iMessage does. There are subscription services that Apple sells to generate even higher profit margins than the hardware. That's why they're cross-platform. That's why their volume plays, not to make any Apple device more valuable, but to make those services themselves more valuable, including and especially with bundles and family plans. Because Apple is, at the end of the day, a grown-ass for-profit company, not anyone's big tech mom, dad, parent type person. And since they're not gonna subsidize iMessage for Android through data harvesting, the way a lot of the other free as in Facebook services are subsidized, that only leaves subscription. So. Just hear me out on this. iMessage Plus, three bucks a month, mark as unread, retractions, and full on bougie gold bubble for that ultimate premium paid flex. Bundled in with iCloud Plus and Private Relay for just five bucks a month or free as part of Apple One. And I'm kidding, I'm kind of kidding because Apple certainly is not at all adverse to US only or even US mostly services. And it's doubtful they'd gain an extra billion Android users more like just some portion of US teens and tech media types, the latter of which will still dual wield with iPhones anyway. But it's also just all shades of bougie gold ridiculous. So the other option is to make iMessage for the web, not like Apple just did with FaceTime, which is opportunistic and ephemeral, but persistent like mail and iCloud.com, provided Apple could figure out the right security model it at least make it possible for a way, way better experience with less SMS fallback, but also maybe it would be halo enough to drive a few more Android switchers. You know, just make their bubbles teal so they're already part of the way there. Now, I'm sure Apple runs those profit and loss pivot tables every year on the year, but markets and incentives do change. Just ask BlackBerry, and hey, a nerd can and should always dream. But then there's also RCS, or rich communication services, 
the heir apparent to SMS and MMS, and apparent only in that it's nowhere nearly as ubiquitous or mature as SMS and MMS. I mean, nothing is, but RCS includes most modern messaging features, is standardized around universal profile, and has encryption for single person chats, just not for group chats, at least not yet. It's also still phone number based, not email based, which makes a lot of tech people really based because it's super archaic at this point and further marginalizes the already marginalized who just don't have phone numbers. But for iPhone users, it would half fix failover security and mostly annihilate annoyances. Google is also just already all up in it. Fine. I'll do it myself. And they've even started publicly name and shaming Apple to support it. And that's motivated by their own inability to ever field a messenger or WhatsApp or iMessage of their own for sure. And made just extra crispy cringy by what seems like panic over Android's falling US market numbers, especially in that prime US teen demo. But personally, I just try to never look a gift tech giant in the mouth. And while it might seem like just the weirdest of things to thirst bait in January, when Apple only ever announces new messages features in June at the WWC keynote, that is, unless some PR or regulatory crisis forces them otherwise, with software, it really is literally never too early to start lobbying. So will Apple do it? Could Apple do it? Should Apple do it? Yes, maybe, for sure. Though they might wait for RCS to become even more ubiquitous and fully mature before adopting it, particularly the need for encrypted group messages. Even though some would just argue that Apple's massive unified platform allows them to drive ubiquity and just force maturity on the market. Now, if they don't wanna run their own servers like Google is doing, it might just come down to how many carrier arms Apple can Aikido at any given point in time, like they've been doing for the last couple of years with 5G. And if they do wanna run their own servers, what that whole software schedule looks like after 2020, 2021, 2020 Reloaded, and now 2022, 2020 Resurrections as well. I mean, I doubt it would change any bubble colors because Apple will probably still wanna differentiate visually between revolutionary phone features and breakthrough internet communicator services. And it still wouldn't take any appreciable share away from Facebook or Tencent, not globally, or replicate the full iMessage or any full modern messaging service experience. But here's the thing, it would fix Apple's messages problem by fixing iPhone users' messages problem just like a whole cavalcade of YouTube user problems can be fixed with Nebula. That's the streaming service I co-founded with no ads, no sponsors, and extended versions of many of my videos, like my recent chat with Apple execs about M1 Silicon, and with Apple's privacy head about the ongoing battle with Facebook and other data harvesters. Also, exclusive and original videos, including a new studio tour series where I'm going through everything I use to make my own videos. Cameras now, microphone next my documentary on how the original iPhone changed the lives of your favorite creators, and so much more. Because on Nebula, I have the luxury of making videos that just don't have to be optimized for YouTube, but where I know, I know the nerdiest, most hardcore of you will absolutely love them. Plus, we just added an Android TV and Roku app, as well as Apple TV and Picture in Picture on iOS, all ad-free, sponsor-free, on Nebula, and bundled in for free when you sign up with today's sponsor at curiositystream.com slash Richie or click the link below. And right now, because you're watching this video today, you can get CuriosityStream on sale for 26% off, less than 15 bucks a year, less than the price of a USB-C dongle for the whole entire year. And that includes their thousands of amazing documentaries and series like New York Revealed, which dives into one of the busiest airspaces in the world, and how New York's airports have evolved to handle 140 million passengers each year. It is the best way to support educational creators directly and just the best damn deal in streaming today. For over 26% off CuriosityStream, less than $15 a year, and Nebula bundled in for free, just click the button on the screen or go to curiositystream.com slash Richie. Clicking on that button really helps out the channel and so does hitting up this playlist for more, way more on everything Apple has coming our way this year. So hit up that playlist and I'll see you in the next video.